You ready? A. A. Dion. A. A. It's beginning to rain. Hear the voice of the Father. and dry, lift your hands to the sky, it's beginning to rain, it's beginning to rain, hear the voice of the Father, saying whosoever will come and drink from this water. sons and your daughters. If you're thirsty and dry, lift your hands to the sky. It's beginning to rain. One more time. It's beginning to rain. Hear the voice of the Father. Saying whosoever will come and drink from this water as a promise I'll pour my spirit out for your sons and your daughters if you're thirsty and dry lift your hands to the sky it's beginning to Well, that's what they tell me. All right, if you would, uh, let's all stand and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. But before we do, uh, I don't have the request. Maybe you've got ones that uh, need to be mentioned tonight. So uh, any requests tonight before we go to the Lord in prayer? Else. That's what I was going to say, do, GM. And uh, let's remember tonight's service. I just pray that uh, the Lord will uh, come in a good way and uh, give me the words that uh, we stand in need of. All right, if there's no other requests, I'm going to ask uh, Fred Mossinger to lead us in prayer. Lord God, tonight we come to you thankful that you allow each one of us every day to be able to come to you and to faithfully know that you're here, you look down on, you understand, and we can intercede, dear Lord God, for our friends and neighbors and loved ones that need a touch from you. And we pray tonight that you'll be with James in a mighty way and allow your spirit to work in and through him. And let the words that He speaks, dear Lord God, touch our hearts and our lives that will help to grow us closer to You and be with the band tonight, dear Lord God, the musicians, the singers. Touch them as they lift Your name in praise. How worthy You are, dear Lord God, every day. Help us to be mindful to always remember to lift Your name up and give You the praise that You so richly deserve. So be with us tonight. Be with us today as that lie ahead as we go forward. And help us to ever be mindful of you with everything that we say and do. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Haley wanted me to sing this song, so if it doesn't go good, you blame her. <laughs> I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything And more than anything that you can do I just want you And I'm sorry When I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry When I just sang another song Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you And I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything And more than anything that you can do I just want you well, I'm sorry When I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry When I just sang another song Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do, I just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do, I just I'm caught up in your presence And I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment And I never want to leave No, I'm not here for blessing Jesus, you don't owe me and more than anything that you can do, I just want you. Jesus, more than anything that you can do, I just want you. Oh, in I see the sun rising the morning It's all part of God's amazing. 
he gave his life for me.
naked alone. Cold cobblestones, they beat him until the blood ran. They brought him to die on a cross up on high with spikes through his feet and his hands. You can use him, abuse him, mock and accuse him, sell him out for 30 pieces, betray him, slay him, do the devil's mayhem, but you can't shake of thorns on his brow, his eyes on the crowd, all of God's daughters and sons. They're spitting on him, they're cursing at him, forgive them for what they have done. Well, you can use him, abuse him, mock and accuse him. Sell him out for 30 pieces Betray him, slay him Do the devil's mayhem But you can't shake Jesus Well I've had my bouts Of questions and doubts You know there are those who deceive I've tried to resist, escape and dismiss, but there's one who's shadowing me. I can lose my religion, break with tradition, say I hold out till hell freezes. Test him, try him, but I just can't deny him. No, I can't. Shake Jesus I can lose my religion Break with tradition Say I hold out till hell freezes Test him, try him But I just can't deny him No, I can't Shake Jesus No, I can't Shake Jesus. Brother Keith Travel said, Are you here? He must be teaching the class. All right, I just had in mind that I would have him pray, but I think I'll have uh, uh, Diane pray. Do you leave some prayer?
like I'm on. When Brother Kevin asked me a couple of days ago, said, James, will you take the service? Well, normally I just get all, yeah, no problem, you know. And uh, Brother Kevin asked, and I said, yes, without even hesitating. And I've been working on a message anyway. Uh, I really believe that uh, we should always have an answer for the hope that lieth within, within us. And that you should, uh, if you're stayed up uh, on your prayers and you're stayed up on your studying, that you should always have maybe a word. It may not be a long word. It may be a short word, but you, know, you should have something on your heart and mind uh, that you've been thinking about. Uh, probably about a month and a half ago, I started thinking about actually this message. And I'd even sat down with Brother Kevin and even gave him a little part of it at one time. And I said, you know, well, maybe uh, sometime I'll share that. So uh, what got me to thinking about this message was revival. I knew that last year we got robbed of having a revival here. And probably with things opening up, we would probably have a revival this year. So I started thinking about that revival and what I wanted from the revival and what our church may need from the revival. And I started looking at scriptures and started thinking about uh, revival. And one thing that came to mind was, well, what, what is the definition of revival? And I said, well, I think I'll start there and see what Webster says that revival is. So I took a look at the Webster's Dictionary, and Webster says that the definition of revival is a renewed attention to or interest in something. A renewed attention. So I got to thinking about that. Okay, a renewed attention. Because I've been revivaled before. You have too. And uh, sometimes revival, and I'll be honest with you, I've gone to revivals at just a group of meetings. That's all it is. If the Holy Spirit is not in those meetings, that's all it is. If there's not a move of God in those meetings, then sometimes I just think, well, was that a waste of time? So when I start thinking about revival, what do I want to experience myself from this revival? What should our church, what should our, our, uh, our community receive from a revival that's we're, that we're getting ready to have? So I got to looking in the Bible, and I said, well, what is the Bible definition? And so I started looking in the Bible. The word revival is a Hebrew word that says chaos. That means to bring back to life. Kea, bring back to life. Bring back, think about that. Revival. It's going to bring back to life. What? It's going to restore to a previous condition. Meaning that if you're restoring something to a previous condition, that means at one time, what was going on? It was probably a better condition at that time. So as Christians, when we got saved, we're excited and we're fresh. And man, we, we just want all the God that we can get. And we want the Holy Spirit. But over time, I think, not only do we as Christians, but the church and the Christian community starts to lose that zeal. And starts to lose that freshness that, uh, that we once had. So the Bible says it needs to be restored to the previous conditions a renewal of interest after spiritual neglect. So that tells me that somewhere along the line, maybe I neglected a little bit of what I first was and maybe the first excitement that I had for God. Are you following me? All right. So as I started to dig into that, I started thinking, you know, we would all agree. I think if I would ask, I think we would all agree that we need a spiritual renewing in our country. I mean, that's so evident. We know that. What's it going to take to get our country back to where it was? We hear so many times and read so many times that, oh, if it, if it would just be back the way it used to be. Well, here's what I think and believe. It's not going to take one person to get it back there. It's going to take all the Christians on their knees praying and asking God 
to give us back. And then it's going to put, we're going to have to put some legs on that prayer. And the Holy Spirit is going to have to take over because there's a lot of folks that are making the decisions that may not be making the decisions. Well, let's just put it the way it is. They're not making the right decisions for God. They're not making the right decisions, you know, for us to get back to that spiritual uh, awakening and renewal. Let me read a couple of verses. In Psalms 85, 6, it says, Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? This is David, the psalmist, that's writing this. And he says, God, will you not revive us again, that we, your people, can rejoice in you? Hosea in 6, 2 said, After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will rise us up. Kind of indicating some action is going to be going on that during that time. James 4, 8 says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. How do we do that? In prayer and, so, and uh, seeking his will, asking him, you know, those things. The psalmist, again, in Psalms 51.10, he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Again, the psalmist is saying, you know, create, do something in me to bring me back to maybe that first love that I lost over time for whatever reason. Doesn't mean that I still didn't have a hold of God. Doesn't mean that I'm still not interested in the things of God. It just means that maybe I cooled off a little bit. And our nation has not only cooled off, but gone cold. One last scripture here. Ephesians 5.14 says, God will wake us up. Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. And that's what we're looking for in a revival. We want to be raised up. We want to be restored. We want that first love to come back into our hearts so we can start exercising, reaching out to that one that we're praying for. Hopefully, we've been praying for that individual and the individuals even before the revival starts that the Holy Spirit will work on them so they'll be able to come to the house of God and, and know Him. So, what must we have to have revival? Two main ingredients. And I think we'd all agree on this. Two main ingredients are prayer. Excuse me. Prayer and the Holy Spirit. We got to have prayer and we got to have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the ingredient that causes the moving, that causes the renewing, that brings in to that person that's lost and that steers within them. We're praying for individuals to come to this revival. And we ask them and ask them and ask them. And, well, you know, maybe I'll come, maybe I won't. You know, maybe someday I'll attend, you know. And we get all kinds of excuses, don't we, Fred? We get all kinds of excuses on why they can't come, that they won't come. Well, the Holy Spirit is a worker. And if we pray that the Holy Spirit will work on these people, He'll do it. He'll work on those people. And, and it may not be through through me at that particular time, it may be through the prayers that's going up for that individual. So we have to have uh, prayer and the Holy Spirit moving. In Mark chapter 9, verse 20, 29, he said, This kind cometh forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. And that's what we've been doing on uh, Monday nights, that prayer and fasting that's going up for, for prayer and for individuals and to be restored in God's grace. 1 John 5, 6. Uh, John said, And it is the Spirit that beareth witness because the Spirit is truth. John 4, 24. God is a Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him and in spirit and in truth. So I think we all agree we need, we need prayer and we need the Holy Spirit, okay? So the question is this. Do we or do you want to pay the cost of really having revival 
and what, to, what it's going to cost us as individuals. Maybe not in money, but in time, in prayer, supplication, in fasting, and the things that it takes to lead to that prayer. Are we really, truly interested in having a real spirit-filled revival or are we interested in just a group of meetings? You know, the choice is really up to us. Let me tell you a story. This story, and some say that this story came from uh, one of the wisest men of the Bible, and we know who that is, or was always mentioned in the Old, Old Testament, uh, that he was the wisest man, and he wrote you know, some of the uh, uh, Proverbs and, and uh, some of the Old Testament. And whether it came from, that, from him or not, I don't know. But it's this. A long time ago, way back, far, far, I guess you could say uh, once upon a time, this story took place. And this story took place in a village. And it was a quaint village. You know, this is way back during biblical days. And in this village, there was a fountain in the center of town. Well, every day at this fountain, the wisest man in the entire region, I mean, he was known for and wide, far and wide, for how wise he was and the knowledge that he had. And every day, he would come to that fountain in the middle of the village, and he would sit down. People would come to him with problems and situations. Maybe they had to do with the farming. Maybe it had to do with economical problems. Maybe some money situation that they were doing. But they would come to this wise man and say, tell us, give me an answer. This is going on in my life. Tell me how I can come up with a solution to that problem. And this wise man would answer what seemingly was a very difficult problem for you and I or for them, but for this wise man, it was no big deal. He could give the answer, and every time it was right. Well, also in this village was a boy, and he was known as the foolish boy. And he was all the time, you know the type. I think I grew up kind of the type, doing the didos and, you know, messing around and pulling pranks and, and doing things that uh, I thought was funny at the time. And you did too. Uh, but this foolish boy, he was all the time into stuff. And he would go down to the village and watch this wise man answer these people. And he just kind of got jealous, kind of cocky, and he said, man, if I could only figure a way, if I could figure a way to trick this wise man, then everybody would look at me. They would look at me as, oh, man, he's a smart boy. And so this foolish boy got to thinking, how can I fool this wise man? So pretty soon he came up with, a, with an idea. He said, I know what I'll do. I'll go out and I'll catch me a bird. I'll catch me a bird. And I'll go down to that wise man. And I'll put the bird behind my back where he can't see the bird. And I'll ask the wise man, wise man, is this bird alive or dead? The wise man couldn't see it. So he, he did that. Ask the wise man, is this bird behind my back alive or dead? And the foolish boy thought, if he says it's alive, I'll, I'll crush the life out of it behind my back. And then I'll show him that it's dead. So he'll be wrong. And if he says that it's dead, then I'll just let the bird go. And they'll all think I'm the smartest person. Not this guy. And so he did that. 
he asked the wise man the question, if you're so wise, tell me, wise man, is this bird alive or dead? The wise man thought. He thought a few minutes. And then he told the foolish boy, what do you want it to be? What do you want it to be? Folks, we've got a revival coming. What do you want it to be? See, it's not up to Brother Kevin. It's not up to somebody else. It's up to me. It's up to you. It's up to us to see that we're on our knees and that we're praying for this revival and that we're praying for folks. We're praying for our community. So the question really is, what do we want this revival to be? I took a look at revivals of the past. I've got several books that I can look back through and kind of see and read. And I got to reading about revivals yesteryear. And I got to looking up names like Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards. Now, Jonathan Edwards was an American revivalist. He wrote many books. And he created or helped create through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Great Awakening in the uh, 1800s. He preached. Now, he, when he went to preach, he went to preach in, on horseback. You know, he didn't jump in a car. And, he had to uh, go to his revival meetings on horseback. And uh, he uh, wrote a lot, of, a lot of things, did a lot of revivals. But Jonathan Edwards, uh, when he preached, he preached with fire. He preached with the unction of the Holy Spirit, thousands during that time, thousands, hundreds of thousands got saved because of the efforts of Jonathan Edwards. He preached, maybe you've heard of one famous message he preached. He preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. And they say that when he preached that message, that people literally clung to the back of their pew for fear of just sliding into hell because of the power of the Holy Spirit was so strong that it got to them and, and they did not want to give up. They did not want to give in and give their heart to God. And that's the kind of power that Jonathan Edwards preached with. Have you ever heard of Billy Sunday? He's a baseball player in the uh, early 1900s. And Billy Sunday was a revivalist and preached literally three, over 300 revivals across America and in this area. Billy Sunday had a big tabernacle in West Frankfurt. A lot of people may not know this, but he had a, a, a tabernacle there that he would come once or twice a year and had revivals in West Frankfurt, Illinois. Billy Sunday, baseball player, he preached over... Uh, 300 revivals. He had an estimated 1.5 million people that came to hear his message. My point is, 1.5 million people would not have come to a revival unless what? Something was drawing them. There was something there that they wanted to see and feel and know that it was real. He says out of that 1.5 million, they estimated over 1 million people were saved during his revivals. You've heard of probably Azusa Street, a big revival that started in the uh, 19, early 1900s. Azusa Street started in uh, California, and it was a big move of God. But they started praying at, for this revival at Azusa Street, and uh, it started in 1906. It ended in 1915. That many years that the revival went, because the Holy Spirit fell and there was a great move of God. They say thousands and thousands were saved because of prayer and the Holy Spirit. Brownsville, Florida. Anybody ever heard of Brownsville, Florida? 
in Brownsville, Florida, this basically is during our time. And this was a great revival that started in Brownsville. They started, they said that they started praying for this revival in 1993. You know when the revival broke out? 1995. They prayed that long for revival, saying God send a revival. During that time that they prayed and the revival started, the Holy Spirit fell. Millions came from literally around the world. They said there were people from literally around the world that heard about this revival that was going on in Brownsville, and people wanted to come and see and hear what God was doing. They say people would be literally lined up, and because of the Holy Spirit that was there in that meeting, people were getting saved in the parking lot before they could even get in the building. What if that happened at Grange Hall? What if that happened at Grange Hall? Or do you want it to happen at Grange Hall? All over. I started reading about revivals going on right now, today, in Texas, in Georgia, in Tennessee, because the congregation, people started praying and asking God to move in their revivals, in their services. One more story. And there's other people that I could talk about as far as revivalists and great revivalists. I mean, they're all through history. And they all have the same two ingredients. Prayer and the Holy Spirit. Prayer and the Holy Spirit. This happened about 1940. Happened in English, England at a university there. And there was an instructor at this university. And he had a theology class. And he was teaching his guys and gals in this theology class. And they came to the point that the instructor felt like, you know what? We've talked about this religion and things uh, in our class. We need to get out in the uh, community and go to some uh, Christian places some, uh, and, and visit, do a field trip and go to uh, where some of these great people were born, raised, and uh, do a little a field trip around England. And so they did that. So they all got on the bus. They took off and went here, went there, and went to this, uh, you know, burial site of this great, you know, theologian and different people. But they ended up, the last place they went, they went to John Wesley's home. Now, John Wesley was a revivalist. In fact, a lot of people say that most of the theology that we have in the modern church, John Wesley is one that kind of laid it, laid it out. But they went to John Wesley's home because he was a man of prayer. Priest, literally thousands and thousands and thousands of messages and literally hundreds of revivals around England and Europe and that area. In fact, John Wesley is the reason that Jonathan Edwards even came on the scene because he was kind of a preacher boy of John Wesley's, and he brought it to America. But this particular day, they go to John Wesley's house to tour it. They go into the house, and all the students go in, and they go into the living room. And all the students, oh, they're just in awe of because they'd already heard, and they'd been taught about John Wesley, and they were just in awe of, oh man, this is where John Wesley sat, right here. He must have sat in this chair, and he must have, uh, you know, look at the books. You know, here's his books. Maybe if we just, you know, touch one of them, we'd be inspired. So they were, you know, looking at the books and looking at the chair, and then they said, well, come on, boys, we got to go, you know, and, and they went on. They went on into the kitchen, and they went into the kitchen, and here's the kitchen table, and, and they, oh, that's where John, John Wesley ate. That's where he prepared his meals. And just think how many prayers that he prayed around this table. Then they went on and went up the stairs, went up to his bedroom. And oh, they were just in awe. This is John Wesley's bedroom. And all the boys gathered around. All the students gathered around the bed. And, and as they gathered around in this little bedroom, and this is John Wesley's bed, he slept here. And then one or two of them went over to the other side of the bed and they looked down. Here beside the bed, there's these two 
little indentations on the carpet. And they looked down and they kind of gathered around and they asked, they asked the teacher, said, what, what is the deal? I mean, here's two things. They're, you know, they, look like, they look like knees. He said, that's what, exactly what they are. That's where John Wesley prayed for revival. Morning, noon, night, throughout the midnight hour. That's where John Wesley got down. And he put his knees right there beside his bed. And he prayed to God, God, please move. Please move in England. Please bring revival to our people. Holy Spirit, please move. And the students may have to help me get up. And the students were just in awe of that. And so finally the teacher said, come on guys, come on class, we got to go. We got to get back on the bus. And so they all took off, got on the bus, and as a good teacher, the teacher brings out his notebook. Everybody said, wait a minute. Everybody's not here. Now, this is the true story. Everybody's not here. There's one person that's missing. They said, where's he at? So, you know, somebody said, I think he's maybe still in the house. And so the teacher got off the bus and he went back into the house. He goes into, into the living room and he's looking. He's not there. The student's not there. He goes into the kitchen. He's not there. And he, by this time, he's starting to get worried about this student. And he says, maybe he's upstairs. So he goes upstairs. He goes into the bedroom. He finds that student. He looks across the bed. Across the bed. A student had knelt down and put his knees in those very spots that John Wesley had prayed and prayed. And the teacher could hear the student go, God, do it again. God, do it again. But this time, use me. Use me. And the teacher came over, put his hand on the boy's shoulder, Said, son, come on. It's time to go. Billy Graham got up from there and went and did it again. Under the power of the Holy Spirit, Billy Graham preached sermon after sermon after sermon. Over 300 crusades, Billy Graham preached. 185 countries that he reached. He preached in every major sports arena, filled them. Baseball, football, didn't matter. Basketball, every major arena he filled. Because he dared to get on his knees, say, God, do it again. Do it again. But this time, use me. And that's my prayer. I hope you have that, day, that same desire. I want to see revival. I want to see revival. And I can truly say, God, Use me. Now, it may not be that it's in a big bus, big uh, tent, and, but I can do my part. Use me. Holy Spirit, use me. So tonight, as I finish, I'm going to ask Dion if he would play Amazing Grace. And if you want to see revival at Grange Hall, I'm going to ask you to come and just put your knees in these places say God use me and however you want to use me if it's inviting making phone calls 
God, I want to see revival. Use me. Would you stand, please? And as Dion plays, will you come? Maybe that's one that you're praying for, that you need to be praying for. Maybe that's all you want to do. But if you will say, God, use me. tonight. Uh, anybody have anything to say before I close? I'm just the mouthpiece. Beth to tell you that. I was already warned, don't make fun of anybody. So I'm on my wife. It's okay. I have paperwork. <laughs>